Hi, and welcome to True Love No Shame, a podcast on recovering from Christian purity culture. I'm Danny Fankhauser, author of Shameless, How I Lost My Virginity and Kept My Faith. You can learn more about my book at shamelessthebook.com. I'm here today with Amy Voyagen, founder of wildflowersex.com, a sexual wellness store. Amy and I share a lot of the same goals in destigmatizing sex, and she has an amazing background in sex education. So I'm excited to share with you all what she's working on. So Amy, I first want to start out. So the first time I walked into a sex store was actually several years ago, I lived in San Diego. And there was sort of a a street fair going on where all the stores were open and had special things going on. And it was with a friend and, you know, we both had a Christian background, went to Christian college together, and we're kind of just browsing around and was like, Oh, let's go into this store. And, you know, without really realizing what it was. And as we started walking through, one of the first things I saw was a dildo. And I was like, Oh, my gosh, that's that's so much bigger than I would have expected. Uh, you know, tampons were painful for me to put in. And it was just like, how, how does that even work as a Christian who was waiting until I was married to have sex? Um, I just had no idea. And so it was just such a shock. So, so that's why I love how your store combines the, the education and the accessories. And so it's kind of like, here's something cool that you can use. And then here's um, some background on it, which I think is so essential. So tell me more about the background behind Wildflower and, and how you got started. Yeah, totally. I, I totally understand your like first experience of a sex store. I feel like that is a quite common experience, even if you don't come from the same background that you came from. It's, um, it can be very intimidating. Mm -hmm. It's very intimidating. And that was my, the first goal in within building Wildflower was I want this to be the least intimidating space for people to come and share about their sexuality, explore their sexuality and not be intimidated by anything. So Wildflower, it's an all-inclusive sexual wellness boutique. So in all-inclusive, it includes all kinds of uh, sexual identities, all kinds of genders, uh, experiences and ages. Um, we specialize in body safe products. Um, so toys and lubes are all body safe. That's part of our mission in that the sex industry, especially the pleasure industry around toys is a very regulated. Mm, um, yeah. yeah, which is like a really wild thing to me. It would be like almost as if like your food went regulated, like something oh, yeah. you're putting in or on your body. Um, so that was really important to me to make that, um, a, a really big part of the store. And then I wanted to present the toys in not only a non-intimidating way, but in a way that was genderless, um, a way that promoted more exploration of either the body parts you were looking to please or the kind of sensations you were looking for. Um, Cause I felt like I, the first thing I would see when I walk into a store is a clear definition of uh, this is for women. This is for men kind of divide within the store. And the women's side always seemed to be like lingerie and like, or, you know, more of like products to please somebody else. Right. As opposed to like, I didn't really see that a lot on the men's side. Plus, you know, I have quite a few friends who are transgendered and it would be, you know, you would walk into a, a sex store and imagine like going up to an area that designated your section based on your gender and then nothing there is for you. Mm-hmm. So I also felt that was like something I wanted to, it was like almost felt unnecessary to have the, those labels like male, female, when we could just be talking about body parts. Um, and maybe that would take away some of the stigma about talking about sex too. Right. Cause that's, it's so prescriptive. It's like, you know, you, you kind of look at it and it's like, oh, well, this is what I should want to do. And, um, based on how stores have, have things laid out. So. Exactly. And I, I didn't want anyone to see like first, like start engaging with my store and then just be like intimidated and turned off. Like even mm-hmm. when you like come onto the first page, there's no, uh, there's no like naked bodies at all. There's yeah. no like ideas of like how you should look. Cause I also think a lot of the products have like really like sexy women on the front and you're like, wait, that doesn't look like me, but like, do I want to oh, be yeah. that? So to be that, do I have to use that toy? Like, and I was like, no, I want to take that away completely. So you're just like, okay, 
thinking about what you like and there's no comparisons to anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. I also, um, we're also very into like education and creating mm-hmm. like an open dialogue around sex because that could be like the hardest thing. Um, especially like when you're talking about something that's so personal to you, uh, and like, even when like certain words, like saying like vagina or penis could be difficult mm-hmm. for people, even though like yeah. they have those body parts. So yeah. I was like, okay, if I can just like put that out there to begin with and be like, this is a, you know, a safe space to like use all of that language and all the descriptive terms to go along with it, then mm-hmm. it's, it could be less intimidating people. Uh, I, you know, I encourage people to ask questions and they do. And sometimes they're questions that blow my mind. I'm like, wow, like how have you existed in your sexual body without knowing the answer to this question? It's so Uh vital to them. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. So I, that was like the idea between, uh, by wildflower. I was like, really wanted to create a space where sexuality became this like less intimidating thing. Mm Mm-hmm. That's yeah. so true. I, I was in my twenties before I found out, um, about the clitoris. So I can totally relate th- to that. Yeah. <laughs> which like, is like wild that. because you have <laughs> one and you own one and like, you have no idea about it. I like, yeah, I have like a pretty similar experience and it's like, mm-hmm. wait, how did I not know this? Yeah. And so you do a lot of interaction too, uh, with the Q and A's and, um, on your Instagram. So what are, what are kind of like the most common or popular feedback that you get from, um, customers? You know, um, in general, I get a lot of people who reach out to me and are very grateful. Um, especially people who are, uh, like transgendered or queer or didn't feel like they had like a space to like, you know, explore their sexuality. And now that, you know, I feel like I'm building like a mini community. So I get a lot of people that, um, are very grateful. I also get a lot of people who, uh, ask questions. It's very common to ask a question and they are the person at fault. Mm. So it's like, I, uh, like, you know, my boyfriend really wants to try anal sex and I don't like it. What do I do? And it's kind of like, well, don't do it. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's like there's no, or there's a lot of uh, questions about like, oh, I have a low sex drive. Um, how do I fix it? And I'm like, you're not broken. Like nothing's wrong. You didn't, you didn't, uh, if, like, is it affecting your life in a negative way? Or is it like the fact that you've been told that you should feel a certain way or right. you should act a certain way? So there's definitely like, there's legitimate like questions where people are asking the actual question they're asking and they want an answer to it. And then there's like these roundabout questions where it's like, actually like you're not a problem, you're normal, your body's normal. And it's more like trying to flip the idea in that person's head. Mm-hmm. Cause I've been there too, you know, like I've been there where I've been like, wait, why don't I want this? Or like, why do I want this? I don't, you know, and like thinking that there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. sort of like they're asking, like, is it okay to, to want what I want? Exactly. The biggest thing is people asking for permission to be themselves Mm -hmm. for sure. And I, and the biggest thing for me was to create this platform where people could feel like they could be themselves and it's okay. Um, and I think a lot of that came from my previous work as working as a dominatrix. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited to hear more about that for people who don't really know what it is, um, kind of, you know, start from the beginning. What, uh, how would you, how do you classify it and how would you describe it to someone who might not know anything about it? Yeah. So I wouldn't say there's any like particular Google definition of what a dominatrix is. Um, and if you were to probably Google dominatrix, you would probably find dominatrix related pornography, which is not the same thing. I think that was like definite shock for when I told like some friends and family what I do and that's they type it in and they see that and they're like, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's like, you know, it, it's like, uh, 
if I said I was a superhero and you saw superhero themed porn, uh -huh. it's like, a little, you know, it's like, se it's a separate thing. So, but it does delve into the realms of sexuality. Mm -hmm. The way that I like to think of what a dominatrix is, is basically someone to explore your fantasies with. And the BDSM side of it is related it, to it. So it can involve like, um, like Dom sub relationships where I would be obviously be the dominant, they would be submissive. Um, and that's a lot of role playing, a lot of like coming up with scenes. I almost feel like I was like back in high school, like in my like, uh, drama class, like it was a lot of like doing scenes with people. Mm -hmm. Um, and then some people who like to experience certain se sensations that they find sexual, that most other people don't find sexual. Mm -hmm. And I, it really makes you rethink what you think of, uh, sex and sexuality are because legally sex is like penetrative sex. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. But if somebody has a sexual fantasy where they get tickled mm -hmm. and you do that, it's kind of like, well, it's a, a sec, it's like, it's, it's not sexual to me but that person has some kind of like sexual relevance with it. And so they find it arousing, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Um, but uh, there's a lot of different types of dominatrixes and there's a lot of different types of people who work with like sensation play and stuff like that. I would say that my particular like specialty that kind of fell onto me was a lot of role playing, a lot of talking, a lot of, um, reliving past situations that people went through mm, yeah. to me, that's what, to me, that's what BDSM is about. It can be, it's different for a lot of people, but for me, BDSM is about exploring different sensations and feelings and reenacting different sensations and feelings until you feel comfortable with them or you feel okay with them. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's different to every single person, but yeah, it's a lot of like exploring like the inner psychology of like how your brain works. Yeah. So that, um, so that actually reminds me of something. So say someone like myself, uh, parents spanked them as a child as, as punishment. Is that something where like, maybe they would desire oh, totally. that? Kind of, so that, totally. that's the kind of thing that comes up a lot. Yeah. And it, it, it's, I see how it, it's not for everyone. And, but I also see how it is beneficial for people. So say you, yeah, you got spanked a lot as a child and that kind of created some kind of, um, like something that affected your psyche where you didn't feel confident or you felt like you were constantly in trouble or you didn't feel in control. Um, all those different kinds of thoughts that can come from being spanked as a child mm -hmm. and, and then you wanted to be spanked as an adult. It's almost as if you're like reliving that experience so you can make it into your own experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? So you're like, so it's a way of healing a lot of past trauma, which is wild because a lot of people would think, well, aren't you inflicting trauma for what you're doing? Right. And you're yeah. like, no, because it's consenting and people are asking for a certain thing. It's like, um, it's like if you had an instant when you were younger and you were like almost drowned in a swimming pool and then you asked someone to push you in so you could get over it. It's, oh, it's yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like, totally. a very, it's a <laughs> very like, you know, I don't know if I would personally explore some of the issues that I have that way, uh -huh. but for some people who maybe talk therapy doesn't work for them, cognitive therapy doesn't work for them. It's a, it's a very direct way of dealing with issues. And I've seen a lot of people come to me and leave me a lot better, you know, yeah. like a lot happier with themselves. And that's one thing too is, I, you know, I am not someone who is a, like a lifestyle dominatrix. Like I don't get off on it. Uh -huh. I like started to do it because I, I made good money and it gave me like, some free time to like explore different avenues. And 
so I could like pack it up and go about the rest of my life. It didn't like it's it nothing. It doesn't personally affect me. So I think I was able to do it as a job mm -hmm. a lot more successfully as someone who like, it, you know, maybe enjoys or needs to be dominant because mm -hmm. I'm not naturally like a very dominant person. But uh, I'm also like six one and covered in tattoos, so it like, <laughs> helps, you know. Right. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's a very it's a very interesting career. It's like not like you can't really like explain it because it it's like it's like a it's like an interactive therapy session, mm -hmm. and every single person is different. And like, don't get me wrong. There's some people who come in and I'm like, mm, that's not, that's not what, like, I'm trying to have a positive outcome for you. Like I definitely turn down people that I'd be like, mm, this is like self deprecating mm -hmm. as opposed to like benefiting you in any kind of way. But I definitely set up a plan of like, this is not going to be a lifetime thing for any client that came, I met. It was like, we have a plan and we're going to work on the, uh, getting towards a plan. Yeah. I think it's so interesting how you um, talk about it being healing and how they kind of like move through it and move out of it. Um, especially because the way that I understood sex, it was like, there's a good kind of sex, which is married. And then there's everything else is just like bad. And it's, you know, it's, it's only for pleasure and, um, and it's, yeah, so it's, it's so interesting. Like, I guess, how do you think about, um, different types of pleasure that people desire and like, and how do you think about which kinds are, are good and fulfilling and which kinds are, or like you said, like people come in kind of wanting something that's maybe not good for them. You know, I think any kind of, you know, even based on pleasure, any kind of action, if I always I always gauge it like if I'm not harming anyone else mm -hmm. and if I'm really not like harming myself, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I grew up in a very, I grew up in a very, uh, like very British household. We didn't talk about anything. Uh -huh. we did, I like never got any kind of talk about any kind of sex I didn't even know what it was. I like never, there was ne no, um, there was absolutely no sex education in the in, part of England that I grew up in. So not, not in so school, they, not from parents, not for school, not from parents. And so I didn't know anything. And then when I moved to America when I was 14, sex is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like every, I would like turn on the TV and it'd be like a girl's gone wild advertisement. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> like yeah. I, it kind of blew my mind. Um, but then it also took me down like a very dangerous route of like, well, it looks like my sexuality is based for other people's pleasure, mm -hmm. you know? So I never really felt very empowered and never really thought about like, what do I like or what do I find pleasurable? It was very like, serving to other people. That's how I felt my sexuality developed. And it was interesting too, to see my brother, he moved over here with me. And the first thing that happened to him is he, at 16, he got someone pregnant because he had no idea about birth control or like anything. And it was just like, I went a total other way and got like really, really scared of sexuality, like very scared. I was like, okay, so I've come to America and basically what sex is, is I have to please somebody else. And there's all these dangerous diseases I could get. And I have to like constantly be skinny and be blonde and have giant boobs. And I don't understand. Right. Like I was just like terrified. Um, and then it really honestly wasn't until I became a dominatrix that I became empowered and really felt like I could be asked for what I wanted in my own personal relationships because my job was literally demanding me to demand things, mm -hmm. which I like was not used to. Um, but yeah, it's just like pleasure is so personal, but it's also not talked about. 
like any kind of sexuality isn't talked about. So it's hard to like gauge what's right and wrong. I do understand that like religious, a lot of like religious backgrounds incorporate like these really harsh constructs around sex and like sex being uh, the only good sex is sex for reproduction. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, working in all of these industries, like working at vintage stores or working in fashion and like meeting all of these queer people. And I myself like was having my own internal struggle of like, am I queer? And I was like, they are having sex and they're happy. Like it, it was one of those things where like, I'd obviously heard horrible things about gay people and the sex that they were having. And then when I was like, actually friends with them and I was like wait no this is not this is not true so then it kind of like made me discover more things and question more things and be like oh like pleasure isn't something that somebody can dictate to me it is like something that I have to discover with inside myself what changed or, or what made you sort of question that women are, are meant to like provide pleasure versus enjoy it for themselves. Yeah. So, you know, I think a big part of it had to do with moving to New York. So I got, I got married when I was really young, like mm -hmm. when I was 21 and I just like felt like it was the right thing to do. I, I like, Obviously, looking back at it, I was too young to make any kind of decision like that. But I just felt like that's what was like expected of me. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, obviously that didn't work because it was just like we were so young and still like growing as people. And then I moved to New York and like my whole world just blew up. Like I met all kinds of different people and I worked all different kinds of jobs and I struggled and I had victories mm -hmm. and it really was just like a new wave of independence for me. Yeah. And then it was like, I'm in New York and like the hookup cult, like this is the center of all kinds of hookup culture. Uh -huh. Like everybody's sleeping with everyone and it, you know, everyone's having all different types of sex. Like nobody cares. I felt like it was like this idea of like, I don't know, like San Francisco free love. Like everyone was just right. like, you know, but I was so uptight, like unbelievably uh -huh. uptight compared to everybody else. Like I never went home with anybody. I like never dated anyone. Like I was just, you know, I had a lot of friends, but I always remained in this like bubble of my friends. Mm -hmm. I was also, I identify as bisexual, but it, I, I wasn't comfortable with that because it was like, as a teenager, I had like tried to have girlfriends and my family was really anti that. Like they didn't like the idea of me being bisexual. I, I like always knew I wasn't gay, but I always knew I wasn't straight. And there's definitely this idea of bisexuality being meaning promiscuousness, like in our right. culture. And I was just like not identifying with that at all. So I just felt really unusual. I was like, okay, well I'm bisexual, but I'm not like the bisexual that I see or like it's, that it's that kind of the culture problem. sees. Yeah. So, like labels of anything. It's like, well, what does that mean? It's, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of me. I'm not like any, um, it's hard. It's hard to define like what exactly. you are. Exactly. So I was like very much like into all of these labels and like trying to figure myself out. I remember like having times like crying to my friend being like, I'm not just gay and I haven't figured it <laughs> out. Right. And then, um, this dominatrix gig came up and I was like, you know what? Like this, it, like, first of all, it made me feel so uncomfortable. I was like, I don't know if I could do this. And it, uh -huh. at the end, it was like a friend that was like, just try it. Like it'll at least be a good experience. And I was like, okay. And it just opened my mind to everything. I just met so many different kinds of people and so many like spectrums of sexuality that mine seemed so tame. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, what have I got to hide? Like, it also made me feel really great about myself because I used to wear like a lot of boys' clothes and wear very baggy clothes. Um, and then it like prompted me to have to wear like, like leather and latex. And I was like, yeah. oh wow, like this makes me feel great. And I like met a whole group of friends that were in like nightlife and I started to go to like nightlife parties and everyone just like, you know, it doesn't matter about your body shape or like how your body looks. It's how you decorate it and how you explore it and how you enjoy it. So it was like these two avenues of like exploration met. And I was just like, I am completely normal. And I am also like allowed to kind of do whatever I want because as long as I feel good about it and I'm not hurting anyone, then it's acceptable to me. I like made that decision and I could not have been happy. It's like taking this weight off of myself. Like I, I constantly had this like dialogue of my granddad saying, like I remember him like telling me like, that they were my grandparents are like very you know traditional british Mm -hmm. not very open-minded at all and they my granddad told me this like you can't be bisexual he was just i remember one day he's like you can't be like you Uh are either gay or straight there's no such thing and so i always had that dialogue in my head of being like there's no such thing what you feel is no such thing And that was just a very, like, I got over that because I was like, okay, compared to like all these people that I'm meeting through my work and, uh, just from being in New York, like that is the tamest kind of sexuality, you know? Oh yeah. And I think my experience was pretty similar too, because it was, I was also taught like, this is the way that you can be. And then I started to get to know these other people who were roommates and, see their relationships and it was like oh actually like this is really fulfilling and they really care about each other and you know they're not married like and it's fine and yeah and you're like no one's totally dying happy. everyone's yeah. happy like it was it's just kind of like uh it starts this line of questioning you're like wait if that is fine then what else is fine yeah and you yeah. really go and discover things and yeah sometimes you can get burnt and you're like ah that's not fine i'm not okay with that but for the most part, like it's just you kind of like creating your own path. Mm -hmm. And it it was also very validating to me that I was on the right path or my right path, because a lot of my clients were people who were restricted in their youth, whether it be because of religious affiliations or uh, they got into really intense monogamous relationships at a young age Mm -hmm. and it was just now that they're like exploring themselves and I'm just like whoa I don't want to be 50 and just exploring myself oh yeah you know it it just Uh gave me like this reality check of like you can't like put your sexuality on a back burner and just like not deal with it it's such an integral part of who you are And it's your sexual health is so related to the rest of your health and your mental health Mm -hmm. that it can ruin your life if you don't pay attention to it. Yeah. And And I think uh, that's, I think that's one of the, the big reasons that convinced me was just like, you know, why does it make sense? If you're getting married at 18, it might make sense to wait till you're married to have sex, but why does it make sense if you're, you know, going to start a company and move around a bunch and maybe get married when you're 50, if anything. And, you know, it just didn't, it wasn't logical anymore for me. Um, exactly. I think that times are always changing mm-hmm. and things are always evolving and we have to evolve with that change. It, it like, isn't, you know, you, we have so many freedoms to, customize and build our lives on how we want to have them you know I think if we're looking back like 50 100 years if it was 100 years ago I would never have lived at moved out of the small little town that I lived in and I probably Mm -hmm. would have like done the same job that my mother and my grandmother did and you know as soon as I got pregnant at like 18 I would have just stayed at home with babies all day right 
you know, it was like, but now we live in these worlds where we have so much access to so many different other experiences that it's, it's almost like not realistic to have certain mindsets. It can work for some people, but it, it doesn't necessarily work for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it, it does blow my mind to think about like how much we've changed, especially like when I'm teaching like sex ed and, uh, through the site Mm -hmm. and it's like information that is so vital. That's like only just come into knowledge in the past, like five, 10 years. And you're like, how did people exist without not knowing that they have like this body part (laughs) or like knowing that their bodies did this and they thought that they were sick or Uh ill or broken Uh if they did that, you know? Right. So it's, I think it's just a, the way that we progress, we need to like change our ideas as we go. I don't think, I think that's a difference between um, morality and ideas. I don't think we need to change our morality. I think having good intentions is a very different thing than like changing your um, ideals on how life should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a big difference between um, yeah. Those base morals, uh, you know, like love and respect for, other human beings and and the specifics of like what that actually means. Yeah. You know, it's like I said, it was like when I got out in the world and I started seeing all different kinds of love and all different kinds of pleasure. And I was just like, honestly, like if it works for you, it works for you. Like, yeah, if you're not hurting anyone, if you're not hurting yourself in any way, and you're happy like you found it like you found the golden (laughs) key you know what I mean like just go that path it's like it to me it would seem ludicrous to be like oh no I'm not going to go the way that makes me happy because you know somebody else is telling me not to Mm -hmm. it's like the number one search for human existence, I feel like it's happiness or like finding that balance, you know, it's like what every, you know, thousands of millions of self help books are sold every year because of it. And it's like, everyone just wants to find happiness. And I feel like happiness is just being who you are like genuinely. And in a way that like, you don't feel accountable to anybody else aside from yourself if you feel like you're being a good person then explore that path Mm -hmm. so what are some first steps people can take to discover what's pleasurable to them if they if they haven't really done that before you know i always in anything that i start like talking about educating people about i always tell people to explore it on their own first Mm -hmm. I think that that's super important because when you're having any kind of like interaction with anybody else, even if you're trying not to, you are trying to like please the other person. Right. Yeah. You know, if you're having any Mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah, sexual or intimate moment, you're thinking about how does that other person feel? Like people have empathy and that's, you know, it, it comes into play. So when, you're alone. It's just a more intimate look at yourself. You can really concentrate on like what you feel like, what sensations feel good to you. And I, I used to teach a lot of yoga before I opened the store. Uh huh. And, um, one of the things that like was really uh, like eye opening to a lot of people was just like having the time to sit with yourself and like, feel what it's like to be in your own body. We're always on the go. We're always just like focusing on something else. Even when we're relaxing, we're looking at a TV or like, you know, looking at a computer screen or a phone. It's like never engaging on what you feel like. So any kind of like pleasure, I feel like should be experienced intimately by yourself first. Mm -hmm. You have full control. You can identify things, you know, what works for you. And then when somebody asks, like, what do you like? You can actually say, I like this instead of, I don't know. What do you like? Like, yeah. <laughs> like that's like yeah. a common thing. Like, I don't know anything or like this, you know, like if you can actually be like, Oh, I'm really into this and I'm not into this. Yeah. Um, 
I which think which that helps the other person because the other person totally. has empathy too. And like, that's, they want to know that. Yeah. There's a big difference between like having empathy and having like being able to read somebody's mind. Like nobody's right. going to be able to read from your mind. Even the best, um, like even like the best body language readers have no idea what's going on. There's a, there's a, a disconnect between what you actually find mentally arousing and what your body reacts to. It's, mm -hmm. it's called arousal non-concordance and your body can react to something that is, um, sexually stimulating, but your mind could be like, no. And you can see that, you can see that in so many different examples, like, uh, like teenage boys, like when their hormones are going crazy, you could get a, an erection anytime and just be like, wait, I wasn't even thinking about anything. Oh yeah. And it just happened. It's just like your body found something sexually relevant, whether you subconsciously saw it or not. Um, so it's, it's that like getting used to using your words too. Mm -hmm. So for people who've never like masturbated before or like have some kind of like, um, like you've just had some kind of like blockage with masturbation. I always just say, start slow. There's no race with sexuality. There's no like getting to any kind of finish line. It's mm -hmm. just like a journey that's supposed to be fun. So I always tell people like, get the most relaxing place you can think of, have no, like no disturbances, lock your door and just ha have no expectations. Don't come in it being like, okay, I have to, use this toy this way and I have to explore my body this way. And this is what I'm no. Just start with what feels good. And I, it, sometimes I do coaching for people and I, I talk about like writing it in a journal and like writing it down and then reading that journal out loud and just getting used to saying different words out loud can be really transformative for people. Like, talking about your vagina, talking about your penis. Like some people can't even say those words, uh -huh. you know? So I think it all begins with like a, a very introspective look into what makes you feel good and try to take all of the judgment away. And I know it takes time. That's the thing too. It's like, like I said, it's no race. Mm-hmm. Right. But it, it is so healthy for, for you for some reasons to, to have that pleasure as part of your life. And I think as humans, we give, 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 and, uh, we forget to receive. So totally, especially, I feel like the, that's true, especially for women. I feel like we're taught to like, that's our role, like to just like give and give and give until like we're depleted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but there is, I think especially this year as we've experienced a new kind of, uh, I don't, know, I don't even know how to describe it. A new kind of, yeah. Experience with this white house. Uh -huh. <laughs> I feel like the, the focus has been on like self care and everyone's talking about self care, self care. And it's mm -hmm. like, what does that really mean? And for me, I like to think of like your body as like a battery, like, you have, you have, you know, a full battery and then you slowly chip away at giving it away to people. And then as you get to like low power, you start operating like not of you know, <laughs> function as well. Yeah. You're like having a hard time. Maybe you're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're like sexual desire is completely gone. Like, mm -hmm. so you need to refill that. And whether that means taking a long bath or like turning off your phone or going for a walk on your lunch breaks or just anything that is focused on you. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I think especially like a lot of people are focused on each other and how we relate to each other. And there's so much interaction that sometimes it's, you have to take a step back and be like, okay, this is how I feel about things. And I'm going to turn off all of this like garbage I'm seeing in the media and all of it. Like it's, it's, 
it's harmful sometimes to like turn things, turn on your like phone and like look on like Instagram and be like, Oh wait, is that how I should be dressing? Is that how I should be looking? Is that how I should Mm -hmm. be acting? And you need to take those times to like, be like, no, I should be acting and, you know, living how I want to live. But yeah, I think that self care is extremely important. I push that hugely on wildflower it's I want people to like come to my store and want to buy things because it not only feels good for them but it like enhances either their own sexuality or like their relationship I I see a lot of um sex stores like people like scrambling for things like almost like I need this to save my marriage or like I need this to feel like I'm doing it right and it's like no like there's no right or wrong way as long as everybody's consenting it's like what feels good Mm -hmm. and just like get back to the basics it's like sometimes I feel like things get really over complicated and we build up so many layers surrounding like a like a feelings and judgments on things that I just like encourage people to strip them all back and just really be like, who am I? What do I like? What do I want? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, before we go, Amy, so tell me with wildflower, how are you sort of sourcing? I, I see so many interesting, um, toys and accessories and, uh, from different brands. How do you find them and what's, what's kind of coming up next? So, I may, I like make sure that all of the products are ethically sourced and as I mentioned before, body safe. That is so hard. <laughs> like uh-huh. it's unreal. Um it's it's also unusual to be like in a field of work where there's like the I position wildflower at one end of the spectrum and on the other end of the spectrum there's like completely awful racist not body safe toys that are like uh, you know it's just like very weird to be in an industry where there's like I definitely see the spectrum of bad things too Uh that's why I'm trying to like push it more over to what I think sexual wellness stores should look like um that being said it can be really difficult because there is no regulation around what you put in a sex toy if it's labeled as a novelty then they technically bypass any laws or regulations when it comes to like the content being harmful to your body. Mm, So say there's like a a butt plug that's made out of something that um, has trace elements of lead in it. Mm. If they just put, it's a novelty on the box, then they can sell it because if by a novelty and default shouldn't be placed inside your body, but it says on the right. box what it is, you know, it's like, it's so contradictory and they also don't have to label accurately. So it's been a lot of hard conversations with people. I wanted to know where the products were made. I wanted to see, like uh, get samples of products in my hands. I wanted to mm-hmm. try them out. I wanted to, t- some of them are tested to make sure that they were actually what they said they were. Right. Um, so a lot of research, but also, putting it out there as what I am, I drew a lot of people towards me. It Uh was like, I, I put in this idea of like selling body safe, ethically sourced sexual wellness products and people were attracted to me in that way. And so I got a lot of referrals from friends or from other companies that I was working with. Um, I, as far as like what's coming new, I'm okay. I'm really excited about this. We're like expanding what the idea of sexual wellness is. That's what I'm trying to do. Like, it's not just toys. It's also not just like toys. It's not just lubricants. It's, um, what makes you feel good in your body. So in the next couple of weeks, we have, um, a bunch of like organic, health and wellness products so we have um like some really great body oils um we have like a cold sore killer we Ooh. have like a hemorrhoid cream we have a um a, a really great organic cream coming in for um 
mama's bellies when they grow. Uh-huh. Um, just it basically like anything that makes you feel good about you is what I'm trying to incorporate in the store. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited to explore that and get more into like the health benefit sides of it and uh-huh. not just pleasure because I think it's all intertwined. Oh yeah. Yeah. And even what you were saying about self self care, uh, fits in with that too. It's so important right now. Totally. Love it. Um, well, thank you, Amy. This was so wonderful to hear more about you and what you're up to. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us for true love, no shame. Be sure to check out wildflower at wildflowersex.com and we'll be back soon with more. Mm-hmm.